Welcome to Look Behind the Look, the new podcast that examines iconic looks in film, television, music, and fashion history. I'm your host, Tiffany Bartok. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me at Look Behind the Look. Okay, here's what happened. I've had a few episodes at the ready, but a project that I'm not ready to say too much about for fear of jinxing it um, came calling and I had an opportunity to go and shoot with my subject. So we just got back from shooting in LA and now I am finally, finally releasing this epic episode with the legendary V Neal. I've been waiting for months to share this with you. V is the most generous woman. She sat with me forever and talked about her amazing career. And here is a piece of um, what we talked about. And I'm not gonna waste any more of your time telling you why you should be listening to this interview. I mean, V is the ultimate badass. She's a true pioneer who has been nominated for eight Oscars and won three times. Her first one was for Beetlejuice, which is, of course, your favorite movie. And don't forget, you can watch this episode on YouTube. This one was a complete doozy to edit. I mean, every five minutes, she's talking about a movie that she did that I I had to put the trailer in for to just jog your memory because the nostalgia is high and it, it it's all your favorite movies that she's worked on. So definitely watch this on YouTube, but of course you can always listen to it. And for those who don't realize the span of V's career, you have to see her at work to truly understand what a master she is. I mean, we talked about Beetlejuice here, of course, and then V took the time to talk to me about all of Tim Burton's films. He's my favorite director, and so I definitely wanted to explore their relationship. And this podcast being what it is, of course, we added a few stories from others. You know, Mrs. Doubtfire, of course. Um, We talk about V's origin story, and she also reveals what two jobs she most regrets not doing. So from her work with Rick Baker to her incredible show, Face Off, which I know you watch, and her first impression of Tim Burton, we talk about it all. V has seemingly worked every day of her life for decades now. She shows no signs of stopping, and she has a hand in every film that you love. So I'm thrilled to present to you my chat with this incredibly inspiring woman, V Neal. So I am here with V Neil. That is what is happening. I'm sort of taking it all in at this point because I'm just fangirling out so much. V, <laughs> you are so important to me and you don't even know it. You are a, a woman who has inspired me so much. I was raised on Tim Burton. That is my entryway into your career. And uh, I, I just admire everything that you do. And I, I, called you before to sort of talk about what we were going to talk about and Mm -hmm. it's impossible to choose we could talk about all of the hunger games we could talk about all the tim burton pieces we picked tim burton just your favorite i I, my it's my personal fave that was the easiest thing to do (laughs) it was the easiest way to do exactly because i i know all (laughs) the characters and have uh basically put funco in business with all of the pop dolls <laughs> from Tim Burton movies but um also this i mean you've been nominated for 8 oscars you've won 3 and two of them are for Tim Burton films so right. i would just love to start talking to you about how how all of that relationship happened with Tim and Johnny and all of this stuff i know it started with Beetlejuice it's showtime but before that just if you could tell everybody how you came to the business, um, I would love to hear it myself. I've, I've read about it, but I would just love to have it all in one place. Um, well, um, initially, sorry, initially oh, I was um, actually doing some crazy stuff for these rock bands who wanted to have big heads and pointed ears. And I said, well, you know, that's what I really want to do. And I don't know how to do that, but let me go. I'll find out how to do it. So I went to a science fiction convention and I met this group of guys wearing Planet of the Apes makeups, which I didn't know they were called makeups at that point. I thought they were some sort of masks or something they had on. And I said to these guys, I said, hey, you guys, where did you get those masks? And they said, oh, these aren't masks. These are makeups. And I went, oh, even better. I said, where did you get them? And they said, we made them. And I said, oh, fabulous. I said, can you teach me how to do that? And they looked at each other quizzically and they said, but, but you're a girl. And I said, <laughs> I know, isn't it fabulous? 
That's and, a wonderful um, I comeback. I wound up falling in love with one of those guys. And I was with him for about three years. And he taught me everything he knew. And I took it from there. Oh, man. And you really took it. <laughs> you were in California always, yeah? Yes. So I am Hollywood... California. Hollywood seemed logical, I'm sure. And, and did you, what, yeah. was, what was your training to get into the movies? Uh, uh, Self-taught. Fake it till you make it because there was no schools when I started. Um, I had a Richard Corson book and I, you know, I read that all the time, but I, re- I was really much better at looking at something and figuring out how they did it than almost reading it because sometimes the methods were outdated and Mm-hmm. You know, I couldn't get some of those things possibly, or I didn't know where to get them at the time. And eventually I found out where to get all the stuff to do it. And I, it was kind of, for me, it was kind of like cooking. It's kind of like, if you know what it looks like, then you should be able to figure out how to make it. You know, it's like, or if you know what it tastes like, I should say like cooking, then, and you have all the ingredients, you should be able to figure out how to make it. And <clears throat> that was kind of my approach to makeup. I have all the stuff to do it. Now just figure out how you put it together. And how did you find out what should be in your arsenal since like we didn't have Google and, and things like that? Who were well, you talking to? You know, there to? was, I mean, there was the guys that I met and they mm-hmm. sort of knew, you know, as much as they could know. And then, you know, we all started hanging out all the other people that were doing it at the, the time, which were, there was about four of us. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> One of them being Rick Baker. Mm-hmm. And we all used to hang out together and exchange information. And we call up Dick Smith and ask him questions. And <gasps> Dick oh, was, you know, goodness. always so giving and of his knowledge and supportive of young people. So it was really fabulous. And that's basically how we learned. Uh, Do you think that that's what you, your takeaway was because you're so generous with your information and your education and you really inspire and make sure that people know how to do this. And that's really rare. You know, not everybody can take the information and do anything with it anyway. So if you, Mm -hmm. if you're willing to put in the work and really practice, then you're, then you should have the information. You know, because you can tell somebody to your blue in the face how to do something and show them how to do it. And if they don't have the talent or the steadfastness to do it, then they're not going to succeed. So there's no point in keeping those secrets from people that would really be good and could help you, you know, because you're <clears throat> excuse me, because you're basically only as good as the people that you hire to work with you. Yes. You know, it's like I always say, don't hire anybody that doesn't know what you know, because what happens if you get sick one day? Mm hmm. You know, because the production or they goof up and the production doesn't go to them and say you goofed up. They come to you and say you goofed up. (laughs) Oh, but I didn't do it. No, sorry. You did it. You hired him. It's your fault. Right. 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 Do you know right away? Can you spot it? The talent? Not all the time, because Mm. some people, some people. It it all of a sudden will just boom, click in, you know, Uh, and they go, oh, yeah, that's how you do it. You know, it's, I think it's all in the teaching. I really do. I think if you tell people why they're doing it and how to do it, I think the important thing is to say why, because as soon as you know why you're doing it that way, then, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh Of course, that's how you do it. You don't just say, go do this because it'll work. Uh 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 Uh-huh. You know, Uh Uh explain to them why it's going to work, you know? Right, right. So if you do this, that'll happen. And if you don't do that, that's going to happen. You're really going to hate it if that happens, because then you're going to have to do that. And, yes. You know. Yes. And it's a big <clears throat> cycle. So, so when you, when you were on Beetlejuice, how did the project even come to you? Were you in this click and, and this, or you had been working? I, well, this is really funny. I was doing a film called the lost boys with Joel oh, Schumacher. Just a little, just well, a little my, more. one of my favorite films I ever worked on. <laughs> Wow. Uh, and God rest his soul, who I absolutely adored. Um, my other favorite director. I Bo Welch was on Beetle, was on Lost Boys. And he came to me and said, V, he said, I'm reading this script right now that is right up your alley. You got to go. You got to get on this movie with me. I said, OK, Bo. When I said, well, who? I said, give me some information. Who's, you know, who's in production? Who's in the office? And blah, blah, blah. And I said, maybe I can call up somebody there and get an interview, right? So it turns out that Richard Hashimoto, who happened to be the first AD on another film I did called Nine to Five with Lily Tomlin and Dolly and Jane, and (laughs) he was our first AD. Well, now he was the production manager on Beetlejuice. So I called up Richard and I said, Richard, you got to get me in there. You got to get me an interview with this Tim Burton dude. (laughs) (laughs) And he said, 
He said, well, it's too early, V. And I said, Richard, I'm going to call you every week until you get me an interview. And he said, okay. <laughs> so I did. And I just kept calling. He said, okay, V, come on in. <gasps> so I get there and it's on the lot at the Culver City Studios, that little tiny lot that looks like a gun with the wind from the front. Yeah. And they are in this shitty old broken down production trailer. And I'm thinking, oh God, this really oh, is no. a low budget movie. And I walk in and there's, you know, a couple of little desks on the side, two different little offices. And then there, it's, you know, like a, like one of the big production trailers, you know? Um, and then Tim's office was on the right in the back. And there was this board up on the wall that had these like little pencil sketches on it of some creepy looking dude, you know? Yeah. And I thought, okay. And so he said, okay, you can go in and talk to Tim. So I walked in the room and here's this scruffy kid with his hair all over the place, sticking out everywhere in a rumpled up white shirt. And I thought, wow, <laughs> there we the go. Director? <laughs> okay, fine. I thought, well, he is an artsy fartsy type, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> so we just started talking and we kind of hit it off, I thought. And I thought, well, this is good. This was a good first meeting. And he was talking about people in the afterlife and all this kind of stuff. And he says, you know, I, cause I, I, he says, I kind of want them to be pastel colors. And I said, you mean pastel like NECA wafers? And he looked at me and goes, yeah, like NECA wafers. <laughs> now, I don't know if you're familiar with what NECA wafers are. Yes. But it was this hideous candy that was like back from the 50s. Horrible. Nasty. They were just these ugly sugar discs. But of course, that was very, very pastel. But the idea, I we had the idea. You know what I mean? Turns out when I actually started doing the test makeups for the afterlife people, the pastel was, it, it wasn't reading enough. So I had to go stronger. So we did stronger colors and we actually wound up liking it better when they were all colorful. Oh. So <clears throat> when it came time to do, I don't know if you, you want me to keep going talking about it? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I was going to move into like when we started testing Michael because right. Michael we'll talk about that for sure. Yeah. The, the, it was Tim's drawings, the little, you know, sketchy things that he does. Wow. And this guy would just look like a nasty degenerate, you know, like some like old flasher dude that was like living in the streets. And so I did my first test and we bleached out his, we had this, this, his poor wig went through so many changes in that first week of tests. Ah, I can't tell you. I'm sure. And the first time we did it, it was almost white with ugly yellow roots. And he was just filthy, dirty, and he looked nasty. And I took Polaroids and I sent it back to Tim, but he looked he, he was definitely Tim Burton-esque, but he didn't look like Beetlejuice. He just looked like a derelict, creepy guy. Right, right. Said, oh, no, he's wet. That's way too scary. He's he can't be scary like that. We we got to be able to, like, look at this guy and like him, uh, kind of like him in a weird kind of a way. Right. They said, maybe tone down the dirty aspect of it. And let's see. And I kept thinking, well, he has to be from the same place he's in the afterlife so why wouldn't he be a color you know so then we colored his hair a little bit more and his foundation was never white mm. it was pale yellow but it was so pale that you really couldn't tell okay but we didn't care if he was lighter than everybody else because he was a different kind of animal basically yes. Yes. so anyway so we went back and he goes no I'm still not there and I said I said okay Tim I said let me do what I want to do and he goes okay so I took him back. That's when I put the big circles around his eyes. And I went and I sent a runner to go to a hobby store and get me some ground up foam, colored oh. foam and some moss and stuff. And I said, this guy comes out of a grave. We want him to look like he just crawled out from underneath a stone. So that's when I put all the moss, like he had moss growing out and everything. And Tim looked and goes, oh my God. He said, okay, that's good. <gasps> so he, he wound up liking what I did and that was really fantastic. And, and so that's how we did it. But another cute story about that was Michael didn't want his nose. He wanted a different nose, but we had no budget basically. Right. I mean, we made everything in the trailer that we put on him because we made our own ball caps. We, we did everything. Really? And, oh yeah. Cause we had to, cause we had no money. Wow. But, um, so I said, I said to uh, Steve Laporte was my working with me on the film. I said, Steve, I said, do you have any like broken noses from any shows you've ever done or anything? He goes, 
He says, nobody says, I have some swollen lips. Should we try them? And he had a little uh, (laughs) bag of prosthetics. So we had these two swollen lips, you know. And what we did was we put one on one side of his nose and one on the other. So it gave him that crooked nose. Uh It worked perfectly. They just fit in there perfectly. So that's how, that's what Beetlejuice's nose was. It was two swollen lips. It's two swollen lips talking out his face. That's amazing. So, so you had to do that every single time. Yeah. Oh yeah. The continuity was probably. Keep in mind, Michael probably only shot under three weeks on that movie, like maybe two and a half weeks. Really? Well, if you think about it, he was always in his own world, except for a couple of scenes. Mm -hmm. So he was only with the other actors on, you know, like the scene in the graveyard. Okay. And the, and the wedding scene. Otherwise, right, 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 right. right. He was always in his own little world. So, and we just, and all of his shooting was done within those couple of weeks. And he was, he was into it or did he get Michael was so into it. He even let me put on acrylic nails on him. So he didn't have to mess around with it, but I wanted them to be really nasty and have grooves in them and I'll be all chewed up. And everything. Oh, right. <laughs> he goes, Oh really? I said, yeah, yeah. Get your drill, get them all nasty. I want them all jaggedy and everything. And he let me do it. And we just kept him on for the couple of weeks that he shot. It was fantastic. Oh, that's perfect. You know, then they don't have to worry about, you know, snapping off and sticking them on. That's like another half an hour by the time you're all done with all that. What scenario. a good idea. And he just was that way. Yeah. I did it on the Lost Boys too. For <gasps> the, the, the boys, they all had na- nails on too. Cause their nails were like big razors. They were off slanted. Oh, yes. Yes. So. <clears throat> Um, they, I haven't been able to do that again. Talk anybody into that again, but <laughs> I do have a good way of putting them on now. So they still, stay on pretty you, good. you can still, you can still do it. Convince them. There's somebody out there that's dying for that. The, um, did you do Lydia at all? What were we- I, I did? I did Lydia the first few times and then Steve started doing her Okay, because I was doing all the other girls. Okay. So when oh. she worked, because I did Catherine and I did Gina. So uh, you know, there was just the two of us. We had to do the whole oh, cast. So when everybody okay. worked, I couldn't do I couldn't do uh, Noni every time, but I did do her look initially. Oh my god! Did you know? Did you know that Beetlejuice was going to be what it became? Oh no! I no. we just thought it was some quirky little kooky movie that was just gonna <laughs> you know people go and see and go oh that's cute and that'd be that'd be it. I never knew that forty years later they'd be walking around all over the place. <laughs> I, you know I just I mean? saw one on a reality show last night. Like, I see Beetlejuice. I was like, this is, I got to ask V what she thinks about seeing these Beetlejuices all over the world. I mean, how does that feel? You're done with it. It's now. just you, kind of, it's yeah. just kind of kooky. I mean, yeah. you know, when you go to, you know, the conventions, when you go to Comic-Con, oh, when you go to Comic-Con, there's a bunch of them. Them, Edward Scissorhands, there's like, they're all there, you know? I mean, you're a convention queen and I, I just can't imagine the fandom that you experience. I'm doing two conventions this year that aren't even, I mean, that, you know, that are like horror conventions. I mean, I still get called to go do all these crazy things. And I go, you want me? And they go, yeah. And I went, okay. I'll Absolutely. I mean, people really, 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 really must, <clears throat> I mean, they must cry. No, they don't. No. I, you know, <clears throat> I it's it, it, it you know I I don't get it you know what I mean I never mm-hmm. I don't know I I just I look at it this way if it makes somebody if taking a picture with somebody makes them really that happy my god I'll take a picture with you you don't have to pay me I'll take the money but you don't have to pay me you know but it's like I, I just it makes me happy to see people happy to see their you know they're like you know they're they're, they're fans. I mean, you're like the, like from face off. I mean, that show wouldn't have been anything without the fans. I mean, there's still fans trying to get it back on the air. You know, I just saw that and I'm totally with that. That show was incredible. Whether it you're really, in makeup or not, it was so extraordinary. I know I had, I would have like fathers coming up to me and saying, your show has inspired my whole family to do stuff. We never thought we would do. Oh, was like, wow, okay. You know, my son's going to art school. My daughter, he says, I even decided, he said, I was retired. I even signed up to go work as an extra because it was just made me want to get out and do something fun. And I went, wow, okay. But the thing that really set it apart was the, that you really were so about the education and you really took the time with everybody and made them feel like they mattered. Well, and you know, we even, we even spoke to the ones that, you know, the ones that, you know, when you say, okay, you're safe. Right. We would even go in after the show and talk to the artists that were safe and tell them what we liked about their thing or what they could have improved wow. on. 
I mean, there was a lot of stuff that you never really saw us do on that show because you only see the little snippets at the very end. Sure. But, um, you know, there was a lot of artists made on that show. There was people that were that came in there not as a makeup artist that left as a makeup artist. Oh. There's people running schools. There's people running labs now that that show really helped a lot of people yes. with uh, to get a career, you know, which I'm so thankful for. Yes. I mean, it, it's just Otherwise, you're just a misfit. You don't realize that you can have yeah, this whole beautiful life doing what you yeah. love. Yeah. I mean, I was always told I couldn't do it. So the fact that I did it. Oh, yeah. Because I was a girl, number one. Really? Women were not makeup artists. No, I know. I was one of the first women in the, to be led in the union. So One of so the first five women. One of the first five women. So mm-hmm. what year was that that you entered the union? Seventy. Four, five, 75, okay. 76, somewhere in there. But I know I started still, the process in 74, but I think I got in at the end of 75. Yeah, something like that. Okay. And then what was that process like? They said, they said, it's never going to happen. It's never going to, you well, just said, what, what they had what to, well, I was what they called a 30 day wonder because what they had to do is they, <laughs> the, the government told the unions, they had to open up their doors because they didn't have enough people in it. So they were, they were required to open up their uh, doors. So if you had 30 days on a movie that went signator within this certain time period, Uh then you could get in. Well, I just happened to be working on a Western and it went signator towards the end of the show. And it was right in that time period. So I remember the day that I got a beeper (laughs) call. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I was working on a yacht in, in the marina on this movie called the dark. And, um, I got the, I got the page and I went and, um, I got, I, they said, call the union. They're going to let you, you know, call the union. So I went and they said, okay, if you want it, you, okay, you're in, if you want to be put in the book next year, you have to come down and give us your money today. And I went, Oh, well, that's a lot of notice. Okay. Wow. I ran back to the first city and I said, I got to go. I, I, my assistant will cover me. I'm getting in the union. I got to go give them a check right now. <gasps> Oh, and it was like, for, he said, yeah, go. Time. Yeah, of course. Go. Oh, so he, he was into it. Of course. <clears throat> you let me go. And was and it like $3,000 or something? It was 1500 back. Then. Okay. Yeah. So it was Still, really, oh, now yeah. it's, now it's 15,000. I, I don't know how yeah, much. I know. Is, I know. <laughs> it might as well, but you know, it's might as well have been 15,000 back in the seventies. You know, exactly. it's like the fact that I had that much money because I had been saving money and was like, yeah, I don't care if I don't eat for a month, I'm going to go give them this money. And I remember going in there to give him the check. And I think the secretary's name was Priscilla. And she was just a crotchety woman. She was so mean. <laughs> she was like, and I went in there to give her the money. I was so excited. She goes, she goes, yeah. And I said, I said, you know, I've, I kind of have on the books that I'm supposed to do these other two movies for this company that I work for. Is it going to be okay if I still do them? Cause they're not union. She goes, yeah, I do whatever you want. Oh, Priscilla. They, they didn't, they didn't care. They didn't even want us in there. We were 30 day uh, wonders. We didn't know how to do anything. We were, <gasps> we didn't have training. We didn't go through the, we didn't have a makeup test to get in. I mean, and the makeup test back then was so antiquated. Even then they were still having people do clown makeups. It's like <laughs> whoever does a movie with clowns. I happen to do two movies with clowns, by the way, <laughs> since then, but <laughs> it was like, <clears throat> it was crazy. Oh my God. And, and like, don't you want to tell Priscilla, go take your Oscar and just put it on her desk? <laughs> well, I, I think she's passed away now, but <laughs> oh, okay. So I sad. mean, she wound up kind of settling down, but I think she was overworked and, <laughs> yeah. you know, there was just with all the people that were being let in. I don't even know that there was all that many people let in, but if you get 30 people all at once coming at you, then, you know, yeah, it's probably a lot to deal with yeah. for her. Cause she was just used to having like, handful of these old geezers in there all the time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> or what I thought were old geezers at the time, at the they time. were probably forties and fifties. Who knows? 40 was very old. 40 was <clears throat> very old. So you became uh, completely validated with your Oscar win. We'd like to thank the members of the Academy, our producer, Richard Hashimoto, our director, Tim Burton, Michael Keaton for bringing that wild and wacky character Beetlejuice to life. And I mean, how, how did that change things? Did it at all? No, no, because I worked all the hard. time. Yeah, I, I worked all the time and I thought, oh, this is really bitching. I have one of these things. OK, cool. Put it on the shelf. And away I went. I just kept working, kept going. 
so so this relationship with Tim was solidified for sure or were you well, still like trying <clears throat> to position yourself to get on all his movies I think it was pretty solidified because we got along really well and I got his you know yeah. mentality of where he was with his humor and his you know uh, just I, he was quirky you know right. and I liked quirky I was quirky you know I had pink hair and shit I I was weird back then but um uh anyway I, when we were towards the end of Beetlejuice, he was already in negotiations to do the first Batman movie. And so he asked Yolanda Tusing and myself to come and do the new uh, Batman movie with him. And we, of course, agreed because, yeah, Batman, what the heck? heck yeah, yeah, you know. And then all of a sudden, Warner Brothers pulled the plug on doing it in America and took it to England. Uh, and they wouldn't let us go to England. They wouldn't let him take his crew to England. And Tim was very young and he was very still pretty new in the business. And from what I understand, he had a very difficult time on that film, you know, not being able to have the control that he wanted or having the people that he had met that he sort of was working with and was, you know, really happy to have that got his, you know, vision. But um, I think it still came out pretty good. I know. (laughs) I agree. But I, I think he was just kind of, he wasn't real happy about the whole scenario. And I yeah. hope I'm not speaking out of school, but I mean, that's what I heard. I don't know. That's, that's, I, just I, heard I heard the same thing. And, and, you know, he probably had to do a lot of fighting for even Michael Keaton. So, you know, he probably had to choose his battles and it probably a person like that, it, that doesn't usually sit well. <laughs> but, uh, but obviously when he, they came back to do the second one, I was there to do the second one with him. So that was cool. And, yeah. um, and that's yeah. the penguin was the, that was the penguin. Yeah. That was the shoe. in you were, you got a nomination for penguin. I did. As yes. Well. Yes. And so, I was one of the, a, a funny story about that. I had also right after I did that film, Danny DeVito hired me to go do the film Hoffa with him. Yes. And I also got nominated for Hoffa. So in that same year, <laughs> I had two nominations and I lost both of them because of course, we were up against Bram Stoker's Dracula and everybody knew Dracula. that Bram Stoker's Dracula was going to win. There was no way we were going to win. I tried to look up what, what that was that, that swept that year. Okay. So it was Dracula. Got yeah. it. And, and what was so fun about that was one, the may, the one film Hoffa I did with Greg Cannon, who also did Dracula. So oh, he was okay. up for two nominations and I was up Stop. for two nominations. <laughs> It was kind of a, it was kind of a kooky year. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. Well, did you, were you just, what do you feel when you don't get, do you feel like, oh, that's, I'm glad my friend got it. I mean, I assume that's how you feel. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I I knew he was going to win. I mean, he deserved it. I mean, you know, it's like, you you never know what's going to happen. It's just like, I never thought we would win for Beetlejuice. I thought coming to America was going to win. I mean, those makeups that Rick Baker did in coming to America were, you know, off the charts and and amazing. And I, you know, Rick had asked me to come in and put hands on Eddie Murphy for him for a couple of days. And, and I went and did, so I saw those makeups in person. They were, oh, they were stunning. Obviously Tim came to you for Edward Scissorhands. Yeah. Okay. Now, now, did you do what happened to create Edward Scissorhands? Tell me everything. Well, first of all, you know, like I said, Tim does his drawings. His characters are always, they come from Tim, you know? And by the time I got involved with him, because they did it at Stan Winston Studios, when I went in to do the test makeup at Stan's, they already had full bust with him basically made up. You know, they somebody had painted them up and I went, okay, well, yeah, that's, that's Tim's stuff. I mean, because I look at it this way, it's like something like Tim designs things, you know, as a makeup artist mm-hmm. working for him, you never really design anything. You go off of his aesthetic. Okay. You know what I mean? You just bring it to life. Right. So I went, OK, so, you know, of course, nobody could tell me what colors they use. So I just figured all that out on my own and I put my own spin to it, you know. And one of the fun things that we did do on Edward Scissorhands that I don't know that anybody really knew this. But I talked to Johnny about it and we decided it would be a really good idea to slightly change the angle of his eyes, depending on what scene we were shooting. Because if he wasn't, because most of the time he looked really sad and perplexed. 
I mean, like a, a really good example would be like at the very end when he kills uh, Michael Hall's character. Mm-hmm. Um, he, we, I made it so he looked really mad. So we, we really mm-hmm. scooped him in to make him look like he was really pissed off. Because when you do a makeup where you have a fixed look on a on an actor's face, it's very difficult difficult for them to emote anything but whatever you paint on their face. It's like right. a clown makeup, you know. And most of those makeups are very much like clown makeups. Right. You don't really, you can't really see emotion through them. So we kind of just did that, you know. It's like I just kind of like just. And just the ever so slight change of the angle of the little of the eyes or whatever. And it worked really well. Because the eyebrows would go, they went up and that makes all the difference in the world. I've seen people, they don't look anything like Johnny Depp and then they recreate the look. And then when they plug in those eyebrows, I'm just like, oh, that's the key. I just recreated the um, Edward Scissorhands makeup actually. And um, it was it was really sweet. It was so much fun to do. And when we started taking pictures, somebody put on the music and I started crying. I'm sure. It was like, oh my God. I'm sure. It was so cool. I that mean, was for IMATS? It was really cool. For, for IMATS? No, th- this was for IMATS. Yes, for the virtual IMATS. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, I, cr- I we we just watched it yesterday again because my son wanted to see it because I showed it him it a, maybe a little bit too early and he was scared. So now he was like, "Why was why was I scared? Why was I scared?" How old is he now? Sweet. Now he's twelve. So and then I accidentally showed him Sweeney Todd. We'll talk about that later. I was like, "Oops." Oh yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a little strong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so so Edward says oh, I wanted to ask if you did Kim as well. Did you do um Winona Ryder for, yes, I did. for that? I, I did. was wondering I about that. Well. Because I do want to talk to you about the uh stigma that that there's two different worlds that a movie makeup person can't do beauty and a beauty person can't do special effects and stuff. And what I love about your work is that you make the women so beautiful and and even, even your monster makeup is beautiful and so emotive. So like, can you talk a little bit about her and, and how you made it so beautiful? Well, I mean, she was, you know, she was in her 20s. She was a babe. You know what I mean? It was yeah. like she was really young still. And it's just like, you know, anything else. I mean, young women are easy to make pretty, you know. But I mean, if you think about it, like, look at um, I even did Catherine O'Hara's makeup in Beetlejuice. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, I, I had and she was fun to do. That was like a whole other thing. And I did Gina. I mean, I did. It was, you know, women. This is the thing. It's like <clears throat> I, you know, everybody said, oh, well you know, I don't do beauty makeup. I only do horror makeup. And I said, well, then you're not really a full makeup artist, are you? Right. Because if you're a makeup artist in the film business, you better know how to do everything. You know, right. it's just like, I had some guys who were helping me on the hunger games. One guy in particular, who I absolutely adore. He's an amazing makeup artist and painter. His name is Dave Dequi. And I put Dave in the bullpen to do the capital makeups. And he said, V, I can't do beauty makeups. I only do you know, uh, character and stuff. I said, Dave, you're a painter. You can do it. Trust me. So I put him next to one of my best painters, one of my most creative, you know, beauty makeup artists, Peter de Alvera. And I said, just watch what Peter does and take inspiration from him. And he goes, are you sure? And I said, honestly, dude, you're going to have fun. You're going to have a blast. He came to me at the end of the day and he went, oh my God, he said, I had so much fun. He said, that is so cool. I said, I told you you could do it. Oh, you they opened up a new, but it takes a teacher. Why? Because they're afraid to try. And what I said, are they afraid just, of? I don't know. But I said, just remember, these are like really crazy makeups. You don't have to make somebody look like mm-hmm. a Hollywood you know, movie star. Mm-hmm. You just have to make them look fabulous and quirky and wild, you know? And I said, have fun with it. It's just the same as doing a character makeup. You know, that's what those, all those makeups were. Yeah. And he yeah. had so much fun. But it's like, you know, you have to be able to do everything. You know, Rick Baker can do it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, but he's a fine artist, too. He's a painter. So he can, you know, he, as far as I'm concerned, he can do anything. (laughs) But, you know, you just have to be able to do it all. You know, I mean, Bill Corso can do beauty makeups. I mean, you know, all these guys know how to do beauty makeups. Do do you, what do you, so, so do you admit, though, that that's like a, like a stigma? It is. Well, I don't know that it's a stigma, but it's one of those things where it's like, 
maybe that's all they want to do because they don't want to uh-huh. have to carry. It, it's a lot of equipment to carry around. Let me, let me <laughs> tell you, it's a lot of stuff. Yeah. I mean, because I have one giant case and this is like, if I'm like traveling, I have one giant beauty case and one giant effects case. Right. And to try to put the two of them together, I've done it before. It's such a, a cluster. I can't even tell you. <laughs> it's like, right. I got to keep them separate because there's just too many things. And then you might forget something. So I never want to have to take it apart, put it together, take it apart. Um, if I know I'm only doing one kind of makeup, then I can only take that kit. But if I know I'm doing two kinds of makeup, I take both of them. That's mm-hmm. just the way it is. Mm-hmm. 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 So that, that year you were nominated again for Edward Scissorhands. Yeah. Let me check. Yes. And I was up against Dick Tracy that year. So oh, I know great. I knew we knew that Dick Tracy was going to win that year as well. But the thing is, I also worked on Dick Tracy. I did Al Pacino's makeup for. Dick I love Tracy. how you're on all of this. You're on all the sets. You know what I mean? You're like, you have, you're everywhere. You're everywhere. I love it. I love it. So, so I felt kind of good about that because I kind of won it, yeah. and you know, sort of with the guys. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And it was funny because I was sitting right next to him at the at the Oscars too. So when they won, it was like, yeah, he was like. <laughs> jump over here oh my god i love that yes and then you got the bafta nominations too for all these which is well i did get i get did get a few bafta nominations oh yeah. you know what i i think i got i think i got eight bafta nominations too i have uh Six two babies. pirates two by pirates a batman returns and a hoffa and edward scissorhands okay so that's what five or six or something like yeah, that yeah, yeah five maybe and then you won of course for, for the black pearl yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, i mean oh my god when are you gonna write a book like an autobiography you like know a- i keep threatening to do it but i you know now i'm opening a school so you know oh, you just- can only do so many things <laughs> <laughs> it's coming maybe it's once coming. the school gets open i can do the book but right now i'm, I'm working yeah. on the school <laughs> yeah it's like uh put that in the schedule um, and also the whole time you're winning Emmys as well, like Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yeah, I did and, win a couple of Emmys. Yeah. I mean, come on. Okay. So now we're going to talk about, we talked about, oh, I wanted to ask you about the hands. Of course, I forgot to ask you about the, the, the scissors for hands. Like, did they, they weren't acrylic nails. <laughs> no, they were built by Stan Winston Studios. Okay. Stan Winston yes. made the hands, of course. Yeah, they did. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then did you, how long did they, every day you would put them on oh no they were gloves he just put them on okay 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 no wardrobe I think well maybe not wardrobe but we had a a person that's all they did was work on the hands because you know they were constantly breaking because they are mechanical you know what I mean and they were used so we I think he probably had about two or three pairs Andy uh Andy Schoenfeld was uh there from Stan Winston studio and that's all he did was work to have hands do the hands the hand wrangler is our handy amazing man. The hand <laughs> yes. man. andy the handyman <laughs> well edward obviously my husband was telling you earlier that is like one of our all-time faves around here and uh, did he tell you there was a featurette um after oh yeah last night i didn't I know that it was i i was so excited about this it was at the the last thing and it must have been it was rick talking about the prosthetics and then how he said i'll show it to you um i'll send it to you somehow make a file of it okay cool he was talking about how you every day did Bella Lugosi's um, makeup and how challenging it was that it was all black and white. And I wondered if, if you wanted to speak on that a little bit and the process of that, that was an interesting job because I, at the time, I don't think anybody had done a black and white film in a really long time. So there was nobody I could talk to. So, oh, of um, course. you know, uh, Rick did the initial test makeup on Martin and it was so beautiful but it was in color and it was very subtle. So you re- he looked uh-huh. when you saw him in black and white, he looked very healthy and very, you know, good. And so, Oh, of course. When I went to go do the makeup on him, I had to like intensify a lot of things because we had to see the variation, you know, the depth and the makeup and everything. So I took him in and <clears throat> we were doing a test with him and Tim said, Oh no, V he said, he looks too healthy. He said, you got to, really darken up his eyes a lot more, make him really look ill, sickly. And I said, okay. So I took him back in the trailer and I was darkening up his eyes and Rick walked in and he goes, God damn it, V. He said, I knew the minute I gave you that makeup, you were going to put black circles around his eyes. <laughs> and I, I started laughing and I said, no, no. 
Oh. I'm not putting black circles on. Tim just said he looks too healthy. And Martin goes, yeah, he, Tim said I look too healthy. We're just darkening up my eyes a little bit. <laughs> oh, my God. You're like, um, I know something about black circles from Beetlejuice. So <laughs> I do know. <laughs> Well, we, the scene that they showed in the featurette was you, um, that Tim was like, Tim was saying, V's going to be right next to you. And it was to, um, Martin when he was wrangling, when he was wrestling with the octopus. Oh, right. So he, he said, she's going to be right there. And you also had to do, um, the wrestler as well. Was it Thor? Yeah, Thor. Tor. Tor. I'm going to say yeah. Thor. And you were doing him. And so did you, and, and you had to do Johnny. So yeah, you were just, did, Johnny. did you have eight hands? Did you, I mean, how did you, your days must've been insane. And it seems so simple. It really does. The, the effortless quality of Ed Wood required so much effort because every Edward Scissorhands, right. just looks, it looks like effort. You know what I mean? It's like, well, you oh. know, what was hard to do is hard to do that makeup on tour Johnson because oh, that really? character, th that makeup had to look bad. You know, it had to be a ah, big, ugly scar yeah. and he had to, you know, everything had to look like it was done by, you know, back in the, you know, the fifties, but the was like was... not really. And, and I, I said, oh my God, I don't know if I can make this look that bad. I thought, okay, just stick it on and just do a real bad paint job and like hope for the best, you know, and then it, it worked out fine, but it, it's like, it's like I said, it's in black and white. So you have to, I almost had to like squint yeah. at everything to see if I could figure out what it would look like in black and white. And that kind of like wiped out a lot of the, you know, the, the brain matter so I could see what I could see in black and white. But <clears throat> what did you figure out are the main differences with black and white and versus color? Um, your, your contrast has to be really contrast. strong. Mm -hmm. And um, with Martin's makeup, I wound up doing his makeup in like really like shades of grays and browns mm -hmm. because it was the only way that I could really figure out what it was going to look like in black and white was to almost make him up like he was in black and white. Mm -hmm. And if you saw him sitting around on the street, he kind of did look like he was in black and white. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, it's, I have a color picture of him and he did, he looked like he was just sitting there almost in black and white, but it was the only way I could guarantee that he was always going to look that right, you know, and yeah. it was come out that way. Cause otherwise you were just guessing, you know? Yeah. I mean, so, I saw it, I saw it in the theater. I remember, and it was just like nothing I'd ever seen. And I, I knew that people weren't going to be all excited about it because it was in black and white, you know, uh, box office wise. But yeah. you guys must have known you were making something really special because it was, I, it was... I, all I kept thinking was, I don't know who's going to go see this movie, <laughs> but hey, whatever. I was like, <laughs> nobody's going to go see this movie, right? <laughs> it's just so bizarre. And I mean, it's like, you know, and then I had to do, I did both the girls too. I did Patricia and I did um, Sarah. Uh, Sarah. So mm -hmm. it was like, and then I had to figure out lipstick. So that was another uh, thing. Was I added a little that. black to the reds because the reds, I couldn't get a red that was deep enough. It wasn't the right color of deep red, you know, and I wasn't going to use a purple lipstick. So I just added a little black to my really good reds. And that really kind of gave them just that extra little, for some reason it helped read like dark red as opposed to, you know, it really did purple or black or whatever. So that yeah, it, did, it didn't no. look film noir. -y. It looked, you know, like a regular, like a, like a beautiful regular person. And then I noticed too, that it didn't age them at all. Like they didn't right. look older, well, with this, well, which can happen. And their foundations were all very pale as well, uh -huh. you know, but uh -huh. they were pretty pale anyway. So. Right, 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 right. Oh my God. Isn't Patricia Arquette just an incredible. They were both fantastic. Oh. I had already done a movie with Patricia anyway, because I did stigmata with her. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. so I mean, her mean... makeup artist did her, but I did all of her special effects stuff. So. Wow. Wow. Well, um, that got the Oscar, obviously. It did. And, and I really didn't wonderful. think we were going to win for that. Really? I mean, we didn't even have anything. My, you know, Yolanda and I said, well, we're not going to win. So I'm not going to have a. I'm not going to spend tons of money getting a dress and shit. Let's just see if we can go to wardrobe and borrow something from them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, we looked okay. We were looking good, but, and I didn't write a you speech or anything. And I, at one point I leaned over to Rick and I said, Hey Rick, if we win, you're going to have to talk. Cause I didn't write anything. I mean, I said, I don't think we're going to win. He goes, yeah. And I said, well, you talk because you're the only one that's good enough at doing, pulling shit out. So know, Rick talk. <laughs> yeah. So what? he spoke. What but when I thought Frankenstein was going to win that year. Yeah. 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 
I mean, and why are you always up against a, a like a full on monster? Like that's not fair. <laughs> like can't they space well, it out? <laughs> well, b- because back then most of the films that were winning the Oscars were all special effects type makeup. They weren't period films. We hadn't sort of, you know, the 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 whole group of Oscar people hadn't sort of evolved that, that uh-huh. far yet into uh-huh. talking about. Because as soon as we started including hairdressers, that's when we could, that's when we really started talking about period films because the period films are really hairdresser heavy. You know what I mean? Because a Victorian picture is not going to have that much makeup in it, but it's certainly going to have a lot of hair. For Hunger Games, that was, of course, so much hair. Oh, yeah. To not be included in, well, and pirates as well. My God. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's really interesting. I can't believe it was ever not a thing. <laughs> well, we we would include a hairdresser if the hair was really, really sure. special. This is before sure. it was called the Makeup and Hair Award. Mm-hmm. You know, if if there was wow. hair involved, it was really fabulous. We would always include the hairdresser like we did on Beetlejuice and we did on Edward oh, Scissorhands. Yeah. But and, you know, and Ed Wood. But eventually the actual the name of the award got yeah. changed to the Makeup Artist and Hairstylist Award. <sighs> Wow, that's really interesting. You got your Oscar for Ed Wood, and but that was after Mrs. Doubtfire, yes. which is not Tim Burton, obviously. But my God, that my my dad really wanted to know about Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> I said, Dad, we're only talking about Tim Burton, but he just wanted to say, "Did you have fun?" He just wanted to ask, "Did you have?" Fun? I had a ball, <laughs> and he was the best ever. I mean, I still cry when I think oh, about him passing. I what it was a devastating loss. for me because yes. we actually stayed friends long after that film. You know, every time I saw him someplace or if he was on a lot, he'd find out where I was and he'd come over, ride his bike over and talk to me. And you know, and his his personal makeup artist was a friend of mine as well. So, you know, we always, you know, she'd call me and say, Oh, Robin made one make sure I said hi to you and blah, blah, blah. And so I, it was really it was devastating for me when he passed. I was really Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That is a truly, and, and what a time to be a part of somebody's life, you know, for yeah. this epic movie. And But he out. was a gem. He was so great to work with. We, you know, it, it uh, he was always on. So I had to figure out a way to keep him kind of calmed down. So what sure. I did was I took the cupboards, the doors off the cupboards behind us on in the makeup trailer. And I put a monitor up there. And um, <laughs> Stefan Dupuy, who was my assistant on that film, brought in his laser disc player and we started playing in movies in the morning. So the makeup ah. took, you know, a little over two hours or around two hours to do every day. So we put on a movie and I was really surprised that Robin had not really seen a lot of movies. I mean, if you figure, look at it this way, he saw at least 50 movies on that on that film because we did that makeup 54 times. Oh, my God. Yeah. And every morning he would watch a movie. I mean, he had never seen like Citizen Kane or, you know, a lot of the really huge classics. He had never seen any of them. So he saw them all on Mrs. Doubtfire. <gasps> That's amazing. Yeah, we played, we played well, all the probably classic never. Films. He never sat down. He was a hostage. You took advantage of the hostage situation. <laughs> well, and I had then a captive that was, audience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and then Sweeney which is Sweeney is a super um, personal thing for me because I almost quit school until I, I went to school for acting. And when I, I almost quit school until someone showed me George Hearn and Sweeney Todd, um, you know, and it changed my entire life. So I just, I love Sweeney Todd so much. I wondered how much you knew about Sweeney Todd before you went to work on. Well, I mean, I had seen the play, but I didn't know how the movie was going to work. You know what I mean? And, but of course it had to be, you know, it's all that, Sondheim music and Johnny was when we were doing pirates, he was rehearsing. Okay. So uh sure. he was, you know, and then and the music is so specific and the tunes, I mean the the tonality and the the, the keys and the it's just weird <laughs> music. I mean, it's like it's not weird music, but you know what I mean? It's like it, it's it's slightly off. Yeah. So I mean, for somebody and Johnny. I thought he did a great job singing. I mean, 
I mean, he already sings, but it was, it was hard. You know, you have oh to, it's like almost God. a new way so of learning hard. how to sing something. Absolutely. And to then me, it would be. How did, now at this point, you guys have done how many movies together? Five, six? Uh, how many Something like that, I don't know. I done? can't remember. You did three? Well, we three did three Kim Pirates, Burton's. three, four, five, six movies, because I did Blow also. Blow too. So I, maybe six movies. Did you guys meet on Blow? Is that the first one? I gotta no. look at my timeline. Edward Scissorhands. Edward Scissorhands. Okay. So, and, you know, Johnny was still under contract to, um, to uh, 21 Jump Street when we did Edward Scissorhands. Stop it. And he got out of his contract at the end of that film. He was so excited. Oh, my God. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That's how young he was. <gasps> and I can. He I was can't... a babe. <laughs> oh. And then. You got to be there for for that emergence into a movie star. Did you know you were dealing with a movie star? I, I don't know. I wasn't thinking about it. I mean, he wasn't even himself in that movie. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was a he was like a character. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought the movie was going to do really well because it was so odd and it was such a cool fantasy. So I in the story was so sweet, you know. For Sweeney Todd, um. I wondered about Helena's makeup, but you were only with Johnny for Sweeney Todd. I was only with Johnny because they only let him take, I think, five people with him to England. I see. That was part of the deal. Okay. <clears throat> and I had to do his makeup and his hair for that. Okay. And that's a because lot. Because it took me so long, they finally gave me an assistant. Um, this young lady named Nana Fisher, who is now a huge makeup artist, but she was great. She was, she's Japanese and German. Such oh, a great wow. combo, but Nana was awesome because we, we kind of had to make it like a little dance. She helped me start setting his hair while I was doing the makeup so that we mm -hmm. could get along because it took a long time to get his hair done because it was so specific yeah. because I had to set it on rollers to give it lift. That was his hair. A lot of it wasn't a wig. Yeah. No, that was his hair. <sighs> and we had to, it, because it was so humid there, you know, and so damp all the time. Yeah. It really took a lot to do his hair. There was so much product in his hair to keep it up. So that's why there was so many radical changes in his hairdo, because some days it was like so wet. It didn't matter what I put in it. It was just going to start flopping around, you know? Oh, but that's, wow. that's why it was his hair. Wow. I had no idea. because And I he had a really wacky haircut in there, too, because yeah. um, he, he let his sister come in and cut his hair, and she would just come in and just chop, chop at it. <laughs> Just take chunks out of it. And I went, okay, good. <laughs> That's so really Johnny's funny. sister was cutting his hair. And I said, remember, it's got to kind of match, sort of. <laughs> I thought you guys are having a good time, but there's like a job to do here. <laughs> but it was, it was a hard job because, I mean, it was, it was crazy. And I just remember Tim had, he, he loved torturing me, he would just mess with me all the time. <laughs> It's it just insane. <laughs> what do you but do? Sweeney, Sweeney was a trip, you know, when we shot. And also because there was so much, there was a, um, I don't know what they call, they used to call it putting like a silver wash on it, but I don't know what it is now. It's new technology. Uh, or Well, it's not even that new because that's an old movie now, but um, because of the treatment that they did to the film that took so much of the actual color out of the film in order to make that blood red, that mm. blood was literally a really bright coral color. I mean, oh, like really? almost day glow. Okay. And we, um, when they shot the scenes of when they slit the guy's throat, yep. they, the, the guys that were doing the prosthetics on the film, they had, you know, these big neck pieces that they put on them. Well, there was also like, I'd say at least six tubes running up that thing oh. that blood would squirt out of. And so when they cut his neck from side to side, when it would start squirting, yeah, the entire room was, they had white down on the room, on the floors. Everybody was dressed in white hazmat suits. All the cover, all the cameras were covered up with white and they did that so they could find the blood because they had oh. to clean it because the rooms were always so dark too. I don't know, but that, I mean, it was the easiest way to find the blood wherever it got squirted. <laughs> But at the end of those scenes, everybody would just start screaming with laughter because the whole room was like day glow orange because there was so much blood everywhere. Oh, my the God. Guys, 
the guys that were pumping the blood were laughing hysterically. I mean, it was, it was a trip. I mean, when I, when I took, when I took Johnny out, I have great shots of Johnny walking off the stage, like outside of his trailer. And I took a couple of quick pictures of him to match because we had to keep matching. Yeah, you know how hard it is to match that blood squirt. I can't imagine. Let me tell you, it was not easy. I mean, oh. I think I did a pretty okay job of yeah. it, but it was really hard to match that blood squirting because I didn't have an apparatus that would squirt that way because a lot of the times it was like a splashback effect and stuff. So he, it was like sure. all over the place, but. He was and then you have crazy. Sasha Baron Cohen's personality in the middle of all of that mania. I'm sure you guys were like side splitting. Well, oh. he was, um, you know, Sasha was actually pretty quiet on that film. I think. Oh, really? Um, My, I maybe remember, he was intimidated. I, I remember, uh, I, I don't know why, but I talked to him at one point. I kind of didn't talk to a lot of people because we were kind of our own island. Yeah. Like when Johnny would leave the stage, I would leave with him. with him. Yeah. But um. I did talk to, um, you know, I, I talked to the other makeup artists and stuff because I took a lot of products over there to give away mm-hmm. and I gave them to the department head to give to the other makeup artists. And like two weeks later, they were still sitting under a station. I said, Hey, I said, give me, give me that stuff. I'm going to take it over to the bullpen. She goes, okay. So I took it over and I gave all this makeup away to all the bull. They said, wow, thanks. We never get anything. And I went, Aww. Oh, really? Oh, I'm thinking, <laughs> God, I hope I didn't do anything wrong. But, you know, they can, you know, the department heads can get their own stuff all the time. You know, it's like yeah. the kids in the background never get any free stuff. Yeah. You know? Oh, so, um, sweet. I took that all over there. They were very happy. And I thought, oh, God, I'm like going to turn into a kiss ass or something now. I don't know. <laughs> but, oh, I, I mean, I brought it to give to them. You saying. know what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, I had fun. But, you know, um, Alan Rickman was on that movie and I had already yes. done Galaxy Quest with Alan. Oh, wow. So um, I was, you know, if Alan was ever on the set, I'd hang and talk to him for a while. In fact, um, when I was on that film, Alan, we kept trying to go out to dinner. So one Sunday he goes, OK, V, you're coming over this week. And he goes, I have this young makeup artist lady friend that I want to introduce you to. And, you know, she wants to meet you. And I said, OK. So I went over to have dinner with him and we were sitting around talking at the end of the dinner. And his wife brought out this really beautiful little cake and put it on the table. And I said, oh, how did you know? And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, Alan. I said, thank you for inviting me over today. I said, today is my birthday. Did and he, he went, know? what? And I said, yeah. No, he didn't know. And I said, oh. and look, you even got me a cake. Wait, that's so <laughs> crazy. Really How serendipitous it was is that? So sweet. Oh. Yeah, it was really cute. He goes, why didn't you tell me? And I said, well, I, I didn't need to tell you. I just, I was just, just cool, you know. Oh. But, oh. oh, see, that's another one that I really was upset when he passed. I was going to ask you. Oh, God. Yeah. What? He was amazing too. Sweet. Irreplaceable. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Oh, I've gotten to work with so many wonderful people over my career. Truly, truly. Last year was like a complete, I don't know. I, I know. But you were working the whole time. Well, I was working on the school. Yeah. And that's, when is that happening? This fall. Oh, we that is this fall. really exciting. Yeah. But this isn't the first school. Well, I worked at another school. Okay, got it. And okay. it, it, let's just say it didn't work out for the best. Well, I mean, for, for my best. I wanted this, to do more and I wasn't allowed to do more. So now guess what? I could do whatever I want. That's what I like to hear. That'd what are better. your, what are the things that, that you're planning on doing that'll be different? Well, first of all, we're going to be doing our classes in one week pods. So when you sign up for the school, you don't have to take $30,000 worth of classes and get one class that you really want. I you can see. sign up and take whatever classes you want. Oh, that's wonderful. So we will have four classes running concurrently. And, you know, some of them you can take in order. So you can take a whole series of them. Or if you just like, let's say you're doing a period film and you're not really up on like laying hair and you want to get like a quick hair laying mm-hmm. class in. Mm-hmm. If we're teaching hair laying that week, you can come in and take that hair laying class so that you can get. So it doesn't, you can be a working makeup artist already and come into the school and just take a class. Or if you know, you're going to do transfers and you want to come in and just, you know, touch up, you want to figure out how to do transfers or silicone prosthetics or whatever, whatever we're teaching. If you want to come in and take that class for that week, you can. And another thing that's really good about that is the fact that all of my teachers are going to be working makeup artists. So if they have a week off, I'll say, well, what do you want to teach? This is what we have. You can come teach whatever one of those you want. Oh my God. So, this is, and we'll have, I, I've been myself and, and 
uh, Lee Joyner, my partner, um, have been writing the curriculum for a year now. We have over 35 classes written already. So we will have quite a group of classes to, to take. Oh, and, and now and we're continuing on. I just started writing the drag classes, which is going to be fun because I was going to do it as a seminar. And I decided that I want to do it as like a week long class. And, and somebody says, how can you do a week long drag? Class? I said, because there's lots of different types of drag makeups now. Yes. And so I want to get the drag artists that know how to do all the different types of drag makeup. I'll have a different, I'll have a different person come in every day and teach that type of makeup if that's what it takes. That's fantastic. I mean, that's going to be a real specific class, but that is going to be a bitching class to take yes. because there's, you know, there's guys that do horror drag. There's, you know, there's <gasps> of like course fantasy drag. There's like baby doll drag. There's like all these different kinds of drag classes. You know I mean? Drag makeups. We're doing reels. So okay. I'm going to do, I'm going to do it. My next one is going to be a Jack Sparrow reel. Cause I just <gasps> went to Martin Samuel and I said, Martin, I need a wig. And I said, you got any wigs stashed anywhere? And he goes, yeah, of course I do. And I said, okay, well, give me one. <laughs> Let me borrow one, you know? So I have a real Jack Sparrow wig. I got, I've got, you know, and we're building the costumes and I'm getting one of the guys that does cosplay for that does a, a Jack Sparrow cosplay to put him in the makeup. And oh, fantastic. we just ordered all the beads for the wigs and, you know, coins and all the jazz. So that's fantastic. I, um, I wonder, like, how how does how do you and Johnny feel when you see all the Jack Sparrows running around over these? I, I don't know how films. Johnny feels, but it cracks me up. I did. I went a few years ago. A friend of mine, Tony Swanton, who actually made all the all the swords for pirates, and he okay. you know he he makes swords for all the big movies. Like he did the hook for Hook, and he you oh, know wow. any you name it, he's probably made the sword or the shields or the armor or something for some movie. And he said, V, he said, I do this thing with, what are they? They're, um, they're like Vikings. He, he dresses up like a Viking, right? Okay. And he has a whole group that does Viking kind of cosplay stuff for fun. He says, we're having a football game with the Jack Sparrows this weekend. Do you want to come? And I said, what does that mean? <laughs> and he goes, it's all of my Viking gang against like, you know, a dozen Jack Sparrows. And I went, oh my God, of course I have to come. You went? Yeah. Oh my God, dude. I was, I almost wet my pants. I was laughing so hard. If you can see, you know, guys acting like Jack Sparrow playing football, it's the silliest thing you've ever seen in your life. I did mean, they you know, you were there. The, the I think they did. You yeah. were? Oh my yeah. God. I, it was the silliest thing I've ever seen in my life. I laughed so goddamn hard. Oh my like, God. Oh my Lord. It was so silly. I think they've done it since then again, but I just said, no, once was enough. I don't want to ruin it. It was too funny, <laughs> but it was really that. silly. Oh, V, and you also have brushes. Tell me about your brushes. Oh, yes. Because I know those um, are an exciting endeavor. Well, I uh, recently relaunched my brushes because I had them. I've had them for, you know, 35, 40 years now, but I just relaunched them. And um, I redid the beauty line so that it's all, uh, cruelty free. So okay. all, all the, all the beauty brushes were all synthetic and it took me a really long time to find a synthetic that kind of really, you know, was what I wanted to put in there because I had a lot of really beautiful, you know, natural hair brushes uh -huh. and it's really hard to find a synthetic that emulates them. And I think I pretty much found one that was good enough to kind of emulate all of them. Mm. So I redid that. Um, my, um, effects, Kit, I added a lot of synthetic brushes to that, but I had to keep some of them are still the natural bristles because there's there's boar bristles in there that are really stiff that you have and they do a specific thing so they have to stay in there. What and do you use the boar of, bristles for? They're they're very stiff and you use them for like combing through hair and okay. like um, no not so much stippling like that because that would hurt. Okay. Um, but for cleaning off lace pieces and um, actually I use a fan brush that's out of boar bristle because it's stiff um, for gluing on hair pieces. Cause I'll dip it oh, in that's good. spirit gum. And it's a, because it's a fan, you know, a lot of people use when they're using like a brush, it's like, Oh, duh, duh, and it's like, it drives actors crazy okay. because spirit gum is really annoying and it's really a pain in the ass. I, it's I honestly, I can't even so, stand it. So but a little fan brush, you go like this and you're done. And it's like, ah. they don't even know what hit them. So there's a few brushes that are still natural hair. And there's also 
<clears throat> a couple of goat hair brushes because when they get wet, the hairs cluster a certain way and they caught and they create a really good stippling effect. So I had to leave those in there. But other than that, everything is also synthetic in those as well. Fantastic. And how do people get your brushes? Um, they are sold at Friends Beauty Supply. You can go online to see them at v'sfavoritebrushes.com. And um, you can. That's where you go. Friends Beauty Supply. And they are my distributor, my London distributor. And that's Tilt Cosmetics in London. Um, in Australia, they are sold at Allied Effects, and in Vancouver, they're sold at um, in Vancouver they're sold at FiberTech. Amazing, and I'll put all that in the show notes, obviously. Okay. And I just have one final question for you, V. I mean, that's a lie. I have nine hundred and fifty more questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. I, I, but I did want to ask you how, uh, if there was a look that got away, someone sent this question in, um, if there was ever a look that got away for you, like, um, it didn't test well, or you couldn't come, you know, fully realize it. Was there anything that you wish that you could have done, but maybe it was cut from the film or, uh, maybe that's it's a really good question, but I can't, I can't really think of anything at the moment. Well, that's good. There, that there is a film there. There's two jobs that I really wish I would have done that okay. I didn't get to do. The first one was I wanted to do, I wanted to work on thriller with Rick for Michael Jackson, but I, and I was the only prosthetic makeup artist in LA that did not work on that film. Everybody <gasps> else worked on it. What but, happened that but, day? I was working on a TV show and okay. I, they said I could come work, but I thought, well, that's great. I'll work all day there. And then I'll come work all night there. How am I going to do that? Right. And I couldn't replace myself on the TV show because everybody that did prosthetics was working on thriller. Oh my God. And I was doing that TV show, the 18. Oh, and I, because <laughs> I had George Prepard and prosthetics all the time. So Oh which is a total my drag. So God. to this day, I really want to talk to Rick about doing like a flash mob down Hollywood Boulevard doing doing thriller. I would really you want to do, do this, that. please? I would kill. I just want that. to do that so bad. Oh. I don't know that he'd ever do it or if we could even ever get, you know, an OK to do it. But wouldn't that be the coolest damn yes, thing ever? Absolutely. Oh, man. Oh, be so cool. Maybe and not said, even down Hollywood Boulevard, but some public place that would just you know they just start crawling out of the walls and shit I like, oh my die. god it'd be so cool okay we need to see to this this needs to happen and then you said no. there were two you said there were two the other project was i was up visiting my mother in montana and i got sent a script by a producer friend of mine and i read it and i said this is the most amazing fantastic script and story i've ever read and i thought about it i thought you know what I think this needs to be a man makeup artist. And I called him back and I said, I would love to do this movie, but I have a feeling that I'd be one of maybe two or three women on the entire crew. And I think it would best be served by a, a, a man doing the makeup on this film because it was all in the prisons. Okay. And that film was Shawshank Redemption. Shawshank. And I saw that movie the following year and I thought, Oh my God, why didn't I do this movie? It was my favorite film that came out that entire year. Wow. But I absolutely adored that film. And who and did was, it be? Who did that makeup? I told them to call Kevin Haney and I can't oh. remember if Kevin did it or not, but he might have. But I, you know, it just seemed like it would be better served by having a, a man do it, you know, mm -hmm. just because of where we were. I thought it would be very distracting and the fact that we were working all in the prisons and, you know, yada, yada. And that's really, and it was true. There was only one other woman on the set, I think. And it was the, the script supervisor possibly. Wow. That's maybe really two, interesting. but one of them never went to the set. So because of the fact that I would always be off by myself, mm -hmm. if I was mm -hmm. doing the makeup, I thought it might be a little mm -hmm. awkward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas, you know, I script supervisors that. always right there at, with the director okay. and surrounded by people and, you know, has her head buried in things with headphones on and stuff. I'd be walking around looking all groovy and thinking right, that right, right. not the no, best that's, choice. That's really you know? interesting. Yeah, I can really appreciate it. Cut to, that. I did a film, cut to, I did another film 
with Jim Carrey and we shot in like five prisons in that movie. <laughs> oh, Philip Morris. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that was trippy. I, I'm that sure. part, I, I, he got the shit kicked out of him in almost every scene that we did. <laughs> that movie was, was really crazy. Oh was, my God. It, that must've been a wild ride, but you also did was. Andy and Jim, right? Yeah. I feel, yeah. So yeah. you holy between Robin Williams and Jim Carrey, how are you saying? How, how, how do you, <laughs> well, do you it? know, <laughs> Jim, Jim Carrey had his own makeup artist. Okay. Even though I designed his makeups for the films, got it. He had got his it. own makeup artist there for most of the time. So, and wow. she spoiled the heck out of him. She ruined him. I mean, she would let, he would tell her, Oh, but what about this one spec right here? When we were doing, um, you know, uh, man on the moon when it came time to putting him in that Tony, you know, yeah. uh, what was Tony's Andy last Kaufman. Name? Yeah. But Andy Kaufman, he was, t- oh, she oh, did oh, Andy oh, Kaufman. I did the Tony. What's Tony's last name. Anyway, Fuck. that the alter his alter ego, Tony. Yes. You know, Jim would be going feed the, I, this like, and I said, you wear sunglasses, get the hell on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, if there's a problem, Jim, I'll look at it when we get out there. And Cheryl's going, oh, my God, oh, my God, you said that to him. I said, dude, you let him get away with too much. He sits in that chair a half hour longer than he needs to. <laughs> Tell him you look at him under the lights. He's nitpicking. He fuck, he, he nitpicks you to death. But Cheryl wasn't there for, for Grinch. That was that um, No, she Japanese was, she was artist. out of it. Yes, yeah, that was Kazu. Kazu. She was out of the picture by then. Ah, so he was feeling extra vulnerable, probably. No, <laughs> I we, need, it. we need another, we need to do this again. No, he, I mean, she, had, um, they had parted ways before that, but I, 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 it wasn't bad or anything. It was just, they were just done. She moved to Arizona and I think she was on to another animal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I like, like I was, I just said that we need to do another whole episode, a whole series for Grinch. <laughs> I'm sure you, that's going in your book. You're going to save that one for your book. What, your, uh, Grinch? Yeah, the autobiography, <laughs> your, the oh. Grinch experience. Well, but I didn't do Jim for Grinch. I only did Christine the- Bransky. Oh, only Christine. Oh, yeah, only Christine. she's amazing. Oh we God. did everybody pretty much of the principals. Everybody did one Grinch makeup because they were long makeups. Yes. You know? And there was so many of them to get ready. There was, oh my God, there was. There was an entire stage filled with makeup artists on that movie. Wow. I was in one of the trailers because I was doing Christine, but um, there was five of us in, it was like five of us in that one trailer I was in on uh, doing the family. And I did, person. and I was at the end doing Christine and she didn't work that much. She was there for a couple of weeks, I think. Okay. Right. A couple of three weeks. I was in between movies. It just happened that I, it worked out well that I could come. And he called me and he said, V, he said, I need somebody that can do prosthetics and make her look pretty. Can you come and try? That really is your niche. You're so good at that. I mean, really, it's, it's just, that's what really stands out to me when I see your work. Well, you know, it was, I, I, I think, I can't remember if I'd done AI by that time or not, but I kind of applied the same kind of techniques that I did on AI, which was like layering of makeups. Because Christine has, she has, her skin isn't like real smooth. So I had to do like a lot of something to cover up and make her look real porcelain like. Uh huh. She had thick makeup on. I mean, it was thick. Right, right. But I'm, you know, she wound up looking absolutely stunning at the end. She was just like sparkling and he went, oh my God, she looks amazing, you know? Right. She looked, she was beautiful as a who. I agree. Yeah. So it, it, I mean, I got to admit, I did a pretty good job on that one. <laughs> Give it, it to yourself. Yeah. It was fun. <laughs> she was sweet. I liked Christine. She's well, She's a talented woman. I'll tell you what, she can do anything, that woman. Truly, truly. Her she's like a real, you know, movie star. She does Broadway. She does theater. She does, you know, movies. She, she you know, she can do it all. Yeah. Sing, yeah. dance, act, the whole. Yeah. Shittery, as I like to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. She's extraordinary. Well, V, and so are you. I, I'm i so grateful for the time that you took to talk to me today. And I can't wait to share these stories with everybody and I to see what you do next and for the school to start. And, and I can't wait for all of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, V. 
Thanks for listening, you guys. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. And stay tuned for next time. I have lots of fun episodes coming. And this fall, it's my favorite time of year. So I promise to have lots of great interviews to celebrate this great season. And in the meantime, please keep in touch and spread the word. Thanks, guys. Look Behind the Look is a Vinyl Foot production written by me, your host, Tiffany Bartok. Produced by Jace Bartok, edited by Nicole Tucker, with art design by Kelly Riley. If you're interested in learning more, find our video version on the YouTube channel, Look Behind the Look Podcast. There you can see rare photos and clips from our guests. And please follow us on Twitter at Look Behind Pod and Instagram at Look Behind the Look. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe. And tell your friends and spread the word. You can subscribe to us on iTunes or any podcatcher of your choice. Thanks for listening to Look Behind the Look.